Hello and welcome to another episode of The Exchange. On today's show, we'll be discussing the topic of the fix-it or disposable generation. Do you fall into a particular group? Do you throw items away or do you fix them? Are we throwing away phones, toys, cars, clothes, relationships? We certainly live in a disposable world these days. So, have we become a society of lazy, ignorant and cashed up people looking for the easy way out? Doesn't anyone know how to fix things these days? No doubt if your toaster break, you buy a new one. What if your phone broke? Your car? Your flat screen TV? Your relationship? Which would you fix? And which would you throw away? To discuss this topic, we're joined by Trent McCarthy, manager of Green Steps, a project of the Monash Sustainability Institute. The program provides practical skills and knowledge for organisations and students. Trent has over 13 years experience in this sector. Welcome, Trent. Thank you. Welcome. It's good to have you here today. Great to be here. We're also joined by Sue Yorston from Relationships Australia. Sue is a manager of social inclusion and has broad experience as a consultant in community services, having worked across multiple sectors. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. So let's start the program by asking the big question, in your opinion, do we have a cultural attitude to fix it or throw it away? What do you think, Trent? Look, I think that there is, this has been a trend for a long time. And in fact, for the last century, we've seen this massive growth in, in, in disposable items. Uh, and in fact, it started with the light bulb. Um, where we, we had uh, originally light bulbs that were uh, able to last for, for decades. In fact, there's a light bulb that's still been running for 100 years. Is that right? Uh, yeah, in, Thank in you, Europe. Thomas Edison. <laughs> that's right, yeah. that's right. Um, however, this doesn't necessarily work for, um, for parts of the economy. So we have this trend of actually uh, producing things that are disposable. Uh, what we're seeing now, though, is this real desire for people to actually fix things. So going back and saying, well, how do I turn this object into something else? If but maybe if it's, it... it's been designed to break down, then is it fixable? Is it fixable? And this, well, this is where, where the whole recycling movement has gone that next step to say, well, we might have an object that uh, that previously might not have necessarily have been a light bulb, but might have been a part in a car, but could now become used in some other sort of industry, some other area. It might be the base materials, or it might actually be that it becomes part of an art sculpture, for instance. Mm. So rethinking how we use things. Uh, someone suddenly light. has a light bulb moment, That's one right. could say. <laughs> Tish, boom. What do you reckon, Sue? Look, I, I agree. I think it's um, it's something that's been coming for quite some time, and I think it translates into like relationships around. Um, with all of that, is a, a mobility. So people are far more mobile. They have a lot more um, jobs that they go to. So whereas I think if you're going back like 50 years, somebody started work and worked with the same company tended to stay in the same place, closely surrounded by family and extended family. So our society these days is much more mobile and therefore has to be more insular and more self-sufficient. And so I think that then is a tendency to maybe look at, well, rather than a fixed set, I'm going to move on. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that people have that, that um, you know, short-term attitude towards relationships where if it's just not going to, if it's broken, move on, it's easier than trying to the process of reconciliation? I think so and I think that again it's a it's a societal trend around you know sort of um, living together rather than being married. Um, we also know that now through research that people tend to look for different relationships at different stages of, of their life. So as a woman I need a and when I'm nurturing so when I'm having babies I need a relationship that will protect me and provide for me and the children that I'm safe in. But when I'm my age now, um, I'm looking more for companionship. So our relationships change over time and not necessarily can the same person fulfil that. Mm. So that's what goes in through some people's minds. Is that why we have, do you think, like a 50% divorce rate? Is it that all that part of I think it's disposable? Not, yeah, I think it's not a conscious thing. It's yeah. just um, it's a sense of, like, if you look at, like, the um, empty nesters, you know, so there's actually been a trend over, we've seen in the last ABS data, for women over 50 to divorce. So there's a trend for women over 50 to divorce and they initiate the divorce. And that goes up that there's actually been a growing trend in women up to their 70s who are divorcing. So there's lots of reasons for that. But what women are saying is, I want something different in my life and I want it for me. And I want to be selfish about my life in that third stage when we're retiring. We live a lot longer. We have, you know, 30, 40 years of retirement and we want to do something with that. 
You see mm. that as well with guys, don't you? That you know they kind of trade in for a younger model, as it were, buy a sports car and a hairpiece. That, that's right. Trends, well, you know? I, I haven't gone down that path myself. <laughs> but, um... yeah. Well, both of you could do with a hairpiece. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, we have a special secret, us us men, with the the extra extra long forehead. So. Yeah. Um, Look, it, it's, it's interesting. I think these sorts of trends are about values as well. I mean, just, just thinking about the relationships that we have and how we balance those and our relationships to what we use in life. You know, if you think about all the, all the objects that you have in your life and uh, which things you have now that you had 10 years ago or that you'll have in 20 years, I think we'd struggle to find, apart from maybe pieces of furniture, that many objects that we actually can, can say we've got a long-term connection to. Um, and, and I think the other big challenge at the moment, obviously, is that as we move to more, towards more digital forms of communication, uh, what happens to the photographs um, that we might, might have had in the past? Brilliant, brilliant comment. Um, I was talking, we were packing for going away and my girls have moved on from even a digital camera. And I said, well, what do we do with this? Do we give it to someone else? or do we, Because they're not using it, they're using the phones now. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, when I bought my those cameras, they were a few hundred dollars, but now you can pick up a camera for a hundred bucks even mm. or whatever. So. And, and this is one of the other trends that's interesting is this idea of repurposing objects that we don't necessarily all want to use anymore. Um, there's been an interesting development where uh, in, in, in parts of Asia and now in Australia where old mobile phones that, that people might have had, even smartphones that people don't want to use anymore, are being repurposed and re-engineered uh, to be given to um, older citizens who might not necessarily um, uh, use the phone that much to make phone calls but they've got an emergency app that they all they need to do is press that button and it immediately gets them mm. an ambulance or contact with a loved one who might only have a mobile phone. So thinking about how we can recycle objects and reuse them for, for other purposes. For other purposes, yeah. but it doesn't help the individual in terms of are we darning socks? Are we fixing the toaster? Are we fixing the washing machine? I think the answer to that is probably not. Yeah, although one thing that we've noticed at, at, through our work at Green Steps is there's, there's this growth in what we call na nanotechnology, which is um, a bit like nanotechnology, but it's, the, it's how you learn to fix things. And uh, there's just been this international movement of transition towns where people are saying, how do we come together teach skills, learn skills, how to, how to actually fix, uh, fix your pants when they split instead of necessarily going and buying a new pair of pants, um, actually how to do that yourself. So these old skills um, are coming back into the fore and it's uh, a very, a very interesting amongst uh, a younger generation, people wanting to be able to reuse these things and actually have those DIY skills that... Yes. Um, so it, that you don't have. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. I am the world's least handy person, but uh, and any time I get a, a hole in my sock, I just look at it and say, darn, you know, and <laughs> then go and buy myself a new pair. I just put my hand up and say that last night I sat and darned the toe of my tights. Good on you. Yes. Wow. Yes, well, I have bad memories. My mother used to pull her hair out and, and darn her tights because my hair was the colour of her right. stockings. Oh, yeah. 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 My mother used child. to do that too, but yeah. it never grew back. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, do people, by and large these days, do they see repairing things like just too much hard work? Can we be bothered? You know, newer models come out, it's cheaper, just chuck it away and get a new one? Well, I had this experience just yesterday, our hot water system broke and, uh, and immediately the, uh, the tradie that came round, he's a, a friend of a friend and he said, look, you'll have to get a new one, but you're pretty lucky this one lasted 23 years. Most of them only last 10 years. And one of the, one of the challenges is that if you, if you don't maintain things on a regular basis, then they do break down. Um, mm. these, whereas if you do regular what's called preventative maintenance, um, then you can get a little bit more out of the, what's called the life cycle of a product. So this is this idea that when something starts to break, it's not necessarily the end of the product, it could be the case that you need to do a few things to keep it going so extending its lifespan. But where do you draw the line? For example, recently washing machine fixed for $400 but it's still an old washing machine. Buy a new one for seven, dollars $800 I've got a warranty. You know, this is we're, we're being forced into not fixing things. I, I, I think. Yeah, and this is a, an economic question as well, because we, what we don't account for is the disposal cost of these of these objects. So the cost to actually send that washing machine, say, to landfill, um, or to to be used in some other way, there's actually a cost at the end of that process as well. So we haven't really costed objects and and uh, and products on the basis of not just their use, but also their disposal. And this is where the whole idea of repurposing becomes really important. I think that's great. Because there's obviously there's a, an environmental impact yeah, on, on this as well, isn't there? Like, well, when we pay for that through um, our local council rates or our, our, our taxes as well, um, so we end up paying for it anyway. Um, what's interesting though is that this also tends to hit people the hardest who have low incomes. So um, there is a bit of a growing gap here in terms of what people can afford um, to have. 
and uh, and often the things, the objects and products are that are the least energy efficient um, end up costing people a lot of money anyway. So how we can build into the cost of objects, actually their running costs rather yeah. than mm. just their disposal costs as well. Mm. Fascinating conversation. We'll be back with more in just a moment, along with Street Talk as well. Stay right here. If something's broken, do you try to fix it or do you try to replace it? More than likely, in most cases, replace it. Oh, most of the time I'll try to fix it. I'm a bit of a DIY man, but if it's unfixable, I think it's time to replace it. If it's something that's very expensive, then I would rather fix it than replace it. Uh, I try to fix it if it's important for me. Replace it. I fix things. I do my best to fix things first. I replace it. Nine times out of ten. <laughs> Probably try to fix it initially. I tend to fix it if I can. Like for a sock. If a sock is like, I don't know, has a hole, then I would just replace it, and some, if my car is broken, I would of course fix it. And do you think everything's replaceable? No. <laughs> no, not everything, depending what it is, I guess, but yeah, majority of the time I'd replace other than fix. Uh, most things, if they're not living. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the times what we buy tends to just break. Um, if it's something that I'm going to have as an investment, I'll try and buy something that's more expensive just so that I know that I'll have it for a long time. So the problem with today's society is that usually we can find things so cheap that it's not worth repairing, but usually items that are a bit more expensive, you'll find people will try to repair them rather than replace them. I relate breaking to items Yeah, which is... I'm not, but if you're relating to a relationship, then it's different. It's just easier. Uh, I live in an apartment as well, so we don't have space to keep things. Um, you know, if something's broken, I'm not going to leave it lying around for a few weeks until I try and fix it. I'd rather just go out, and buy something, and throw out the old one, which is really bad. And I'm fairly handy too, so I think the older generation learned a lot more about doing things and fixing them and improvising around the house. So, do you think everything's replaceable? No people's individuality cannot be. Welcome back. We're discussing the fix-it versus disposable generation with Trent McCarthy and Sue Yorston and Sandra, our Street Talk reporter. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Some fascinating uh, discussions there out on yeah. the street. What were some of the things that stood out to you? Uh, look, probably a real generational divide, to be honest. Yes. Um, you, you speak to the older generation and they're fully into fixing things and then you speak to the younger generation, oh, no, replace it. Um, obviously, there were some exceptions to that, but mm. overall, differences in generational attitudes, which yes. I kind of wondered how that flowed through the more important things in life. One guy said I'd, I'd replace it unless it was living, yes. So, <laughs> yes. which I love. So yes. relationships, obviously, yes. we value more we, than things. We do value, yeah, because we... I mean, if you go back to the beginning of a relationship, we go into a relationship because we want this to last. You know, we want, we have an expectation that it is going to last, that we have shared values and beliefs with that person and that we have shared goals and we know where we're going and we want to do this together. So, you know, that's the ideal that we're starting. And we've made memories with. too, mm. you know. Mm. Well, it seems a shame to... Throw, those throw away. all the memories yeah. away, you know. Yeah. But also, you were making mention of the fact that you know it's important to maintain a product. Do we learn those skills, particularly with the younger generation, to maintain a relationship? No, I don't think they do, and I think it's it's, it's interesting. Sorry that you say that because. Um, it's one of the things that actually Relationships Australia Victoria is working with the Education Department to develop a program for schools around relationships and maintaining relationships. But I also picked up on the generational shift as mm. well. And for those older people, for people like me, my parents went through the depression. Mm. So I very much grew up with a, a sense of save it for a rainy day and you don't know when you won't have money again so you keep it turning over. You know. And again, when my first car, I had an engine and a battery and, you know, half a dozen things. So if it stopped, 
I could fix it. I knew how to clean out the spark plugs, well, and I knew how to do. Opt -out now option, I lift it up there? and I go, yeah. "Where's the engine? I can't even see it underneath all this conglomerate of stuff." And I think one of the things when you learn how to fix something, it's actually really empowering. You want to fix everyone right. else's stuff. You know? it's Suddenly also you're, a time. you're the cool person. Really? Tell time. me more about that. But hang on, it's a time and a space issue. One of the girls mentioned uh, she didn't want to put something away for a few weeks, mm. and then you've got in the back of your mind that I've got something that needs fixed, and then she doesn't have the space. So we can't. I, I wouldn't have the room to store a spare engine a spare no. battery, a spare... Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe this is about the choices that we make. Um, so one of the things that's, that's really interesting, I, I see a lot of this at the community level, is that people have bikes, um, that they, they might get a new bike and they've got the old bike. And what we're starting to see this trend of, and this is involving both younger people and older people, is people taking the bikes to, say, the neighbourhood house, which might um, have some older citizens there that help fix the bike. And then they give that bike to a charity, which can then provide it to a, a family that can't afford to buy a bike. So there's a, mm. a sort of a cycle that's developing here. But are we obsessed with having the new? And therefore, everything has to be new. We have to have the new gadget, the new thing, and the new relationship yeah. to make life seem exciting. But Sandra, is that linked to status? Well, it could be. Yeah. Uh, well, like keeping up well, with the Well, I Joneses. have four, four televisions and I have a big... I remember going to talk once that Bruce Courtney gave and, and he was talking about why he wrote that first book. And he was uh, an executive in advertising and he said he, he actually had that light bulb moment and realised that what he was doing was, was just gathering the money in order to display the resources. So it was about having the bigger boat and the bigger house and the better trip and all those sort of things. And he just and he quite consciously decided to put it all down and stop. And that's when he wrote The Power of One. Yeah. Mm. So he had to make space in his life mm. to do that. But he, he was very so much well, aware of, course, of that status mm. that we that we follow. Mm. And, and that's sort of where we get to life skills, a bit like you know, preventative maintenance on your relationship. It's also about um, the how we make good decisions about how we want to use our money. So if, if we, instead of going after that latest new thing, mm. it might be the case that we choose to not get that new thing and instead spend that money on, uh, that, that we would have spent on that thing, on, on, on maybe taking a holiday or, or doing something other, that we otherwise wouldn't afford to, to be able to do. Mm. So this is, I think, the, the set of skills that we need to start developing more and more um, as resources mm. become constrained, is to say, well, what are the things that are most important yeah. to us? I love that in that clip before, um, there was a, a sign on, on the front of a shop that said, we fix everything. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> what if we could actually um, have that. those sorts of shops in every stro shopping strip? One of those shops that does fix everything, you know? Yeah. It actually, yes. where you can go along and you can say, well, look, you know, I've, I've got this p pair of shoes that need fixing, but also I'm having a bit of a problem uh, with my relationship at home. C you know, can we actually co-locate the fixes? What a great idea. I think we need to see my new idea. <laughs> you made a comment, Sue, about relationships, and I, I find that some of the people that are the older people in my world that have um, perhaps helped me, now I'm finding that I'm actually helping them. So the relationship has kind of been recycled, but, but we've continued on a journey, but it's changed its changed track. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sandra, thanks for popping in. Great to be here. Great as always, and uh, we'll be back with more of The Exchange in just a moment. Welcome back. We're chatting with Trent McCarthy and Relationship Australia's Sue Yorston about the fix it versus the disposable generation. We are indeed. Tell us, we are living in a very fast and instant society. Is there even any point in trying to slow things down and to, cha to, to change it? What it are, we, are we fighting a losing battle? From a, yeah. <laughs> from a, I think from an environmental perspective and from a sustainability perspective, I'm really excited by what I see come out of the mouths of kids because I think that there are children um, in schools now that are talking about this stuff. It's a very so much... So they're thinking They're about thinking it. about this and they know that, that resources are finite, that we can't just keep making new stuff all the time and expect that that's going to solve all of our problems. Um, and, and what this comes back to is actually the skill of sharing. So this whole idea of, um, yes, we're going to consume, but we can consume collaboratively. So instead of me buying a new lawnmower, maybe I can talk to my neighbours about whether they've got a lawnmower that I can share with them and maybe I can pay for the, the fuel for that. And so the idea of sharing things at the neighbourhood level is one way that we can save yeah, money. Yeah, like the share cars that you see in the city. Exactly. Mm. And, it's, and it's one way, I think, for, for, particularly for families that are trying to make ends meet, to go, well, we can still have all the stuff we need to, to live the, the sort of lifestyle we want, but we just need to build better relationships with the people around <laughs> and us. And that works but, in community. Yeah. yeah, but relationally, is that going to cause a problem if you break my lawnmower and we end up... <laughs> 
in, in fights. Well, well, I have a neighbour actually that mows my lawn. I haven't mowed my lawn for years. He's retired and he just likes to do it and he's happy to spend the time doing it and so he does. So but, do you have to do anything in return? No, I, occasionally I would buy him a bottle of port. Lovely. Like, you know, maybe once or twice a year and that's about it. And I did buy he and his wife a voucher for dinner and they were almost affronted. It was like, no, we don't do it for that. We just do it because we can. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Can I have his mobile number? <laughs> That'd be really handy. We'll put it up on screen. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. Come into a screen yeah, near you. I think what Trent was saying, though, if you're looking into the future, is actually going to translate into relationships as well. Because while you have young people who are doing that thinking and that mm. talking, they're actually communicating and connecting. And I think no matter how far we think the digital um, era is going to, to go as humans, we actually need to touch, mm. we need to make eye contact, mm. you know, and we'll, we'll never lose that. That's so there's true. some talk about there being the danger of losing that, and we're seeing signs in young people about they haven't got as much empathy as previous generations, they have a higher IQ because they're, they have access to instant information, but they don't conceptualise it. So it's about being able to work with them because it's through discussion, it's through reading, it's through sharing concepts that we actually get our own sense of ourself yes. mm. and I think there'll be this pushback Mm. From, from I, I agree with you that, yeah. that you know, with, with uh, social networking and all of that, our, our intrinsic desire is to communicate and to yeah. be in community yeah. mm. with one another. So I agree with you. I think there's going to be that backlash at some point in time mm. where we will we'll learn to manage these things a yes. whole lot better. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we won't see as many people, when you go into cafes, six people around a table all, all doing this. You know, <laughs> focused. More, more of this face-to-face yeah. -face yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And this, I think this is where technology actually does play a really important role, particularly um, uh, social media media where I've seen this on, on, on Twitter and Facebook and these sorts of spaces where people say oh, I really need to get hold of um, this thing or that thing and other people say well I've got one of those um, come around and so suddenly it's about building that connection for the first time around sharing something um, but that wouldn't have happened necessarily if people didn't have that that uh, that social media connection as well so I think this is one of the things that we're seeing a lot with younger people but increasingly you're starting to see it across generations someone doesn't have to be on social media in order to access that they might say so my mum might say can you get me one of those things and I might say well I might post it on Twitter and say well um, has anyone got one of these because my mum wants one and I can't I don't want to have to buy one yep. so it's, it's a way of I think bringing people together and it's about how we use these tools for for good um, rather than for for waste yeah and I think that's the key isn't it mm. that it's a tool we have lots and lots of tools in our toolbox and this is just one of them mm. yeah. yeah you've got a little tool in your toolbox. I have got a little toolbox here this is a, a, a book that relationships Australia Victoria has developed um, together with men's line and it's really looking at um, at men and, and encouraging them to look at their relationships. So this came about because of the number of men who come in for couples counselling where the, you know, or their relationship has ended and they say, I didn't know. And it's like everybody else around them knows, yeah, yeah. but they didn't know. So yeah. they're not good at communicating. Yeah. They're not good at picking up the cues from other people around them as to what might be going on. So this is looking at your relationship as from a project focus, because men are very task focused. They like to get out in their shed and have a go at things. So I encourage them to actually look at their relationship from pro That's project. Great little book what though. do I need mm. to keep, you know, active, what are the tasks, what do I need to be doing to make this project work. We'll point to that in our fact sheet. Sue and thank Trent, you. thank you thank so you. much for thank your you. time and thank you for watching. Please go to our website for a fact sheet as well as more information about our show. We hope you can join us next time. Bye for now.